Andy and Abyss is a four-player game of negotiation and control. Now I say four-player game because it's really designed with four players in mind. Now, those four players don't all have to be run by humans, however. They're, it's designed in such a way so that those each of the players can be automated, except for the government player. The government player must be played by a human, and that's because really it's a game of governance. It's a game of checks and balances between different sides uh, trying to negotiate with each other to get what they want. The game takes place in Colombia beginning in the mid-1990s and extending into uh, the, the current millennium. The four factions struggling for economic and political power are the government, who you can see is uh, made up of a bunch of blue cubes, uh, the FARC, who are uh, peasants who would like uh, wealth to be distributed uh, more equally, the AUK, who are funded by wealthy landowners who would like the FARC to stop kidnapping their people, and the drug cartels who would very much like you to snort cocaine. Each of the factions plays differently, and none of them may obtain success on their own. The government faction is both blue and plays very differently from the other factions. They're a bunch of cubes. The government's very mighty. They can do things like fly around in airplanes and beat up on guerrillas. Uh, they have the most to worry about, however. They, their primary struggle is for support of the different regions, uh, and they're struggling with the FARC on that. They, like the other factions, have to think a lot about the resources, which are measured on this track that goes around the outside of the board. Government enterprise, however, is more expensive, and they have a lot more land to cover and to deal with, and so they need to rely on foreign aid, primarily from the United States of America, as part of the drug war. That puts them in a direct conflict with these green cylinders here, who are the drug cartel guerrillas. The amount of aid that the government can get is directly related to how much they beat up on the drug cartel. The drug cartel, however, has their own strengths, uh, primarily economic. They get, they're able to amass quite a large fortune, and they can use that fortune to bribe pieces off the board. The drug cartel's economic strength is balanced by a military weakness, making it uh, imperative that the cartel player makes uh, numerous deals with other players in order to protect their precious bases, which are represented in this game by discs. The government's primary opponent, however, is the FARC, the red pieces, the red cylinders and red bases, the, the little discs. Um, they, they wrestle with the government over the hearts and minds of the people by trying to convert different spaces to their way of thinking. The larger political struggle between the FARC and the government is really the large pole uh, around which all the other conflicts of the game take place. Perhaps fortunately for the government, they don't have to do it alone. They have the AUK on their side, whose whole sole purpose is to get more bases out on the board than the FARC. The AUK are perhaps the most restricted of the factions uh, in terms of resource gathering potential and uh, certain abilities on the board. They do have some powerful options, however. Uh, their terror can take away the aid that the U.S. sends to the Colombian government, and also they have the ability to assassinate. The AUK are brutal yellow. Each of the four sides has their own particularities and ways of being played. Uh, the government, and less so the FARC, have a larger map presence, and so have to think about how best to um, use their 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 ample forces, uh, what, how, how, much, how broad to be and how focused to be, uh, and how to deal with uh, gaining resources and expending those resources in the best way possible. The AUK and the drug cartel uh, have to think about how to work with the larger uh, elephants in the room in order to accomplish their own goals, but not so much, not get so close so fast that their own uh, personal elephant, the ox elephant being the government and the um, cartel's elephant being the FARC, uh, that elephant, if they see them getting too, too big, like a large dandelion, might decide to put down its hoof and stomp them down. That's not the only way the game forces negotiation. Uh, so this is a, a rather interesting mechanism that I think uh, perhaps will be one of the hallmarks of this game. Uh, so the, the game is played with cards, but the cards are not in anyone's hand. So how it'll, how it'll go is you'll have a card played here, and that card will show the, the order of, um, 
of preference. So this is the government. So the government would get first call on this card if they're eligible to play. If you're eligible, it generally means you didn't do an action on the last card. Uh, so you have a marker here, and that means you have the potential to do something. So it is that if you do something on one card, you can't do anything on the next card. And you can always see which card is up and which card is coming up. Uh, so if the government wanted to do something with Plan Meteoro, uh, but also perhaps an event on here might be important, he could negotiate with any of the other players to um, do this event for them, and so they can also do Plan Meteoro, and then they'd probably have to pay money to the other player. Uh, resources are readily transferable in this game, which I like. So if we look at the sequence of play here, we'll see that the first eligible faction, in this case it would be the government here, uh, gets to do uh, one of three things. They can either do an op and a special ability, which is sort of the bread and butter of the game. Um, ops are doing things and special abilities are uh, little bonus things that are, are, are oftentimes very helpful. They can execute an event um, which is, you know, nice. It has different special uh, situational things. It's not something you want to do every time, and that can be tempting. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but here, this would be nice for the government. They they can they get a permanent ability if they have the government capabilities symbol on there, and that's nice. If the other players got to do it, they'd get a permanent um, disadvantage to the government. Or they can do uh, just an op without the special ability. Now, the reason you would want to choose this one, not you know, waive your right to do the special ability, is that makes it so the other person couldn't do the event. So in this case, if the government didn't want to waste their turn doing it, an event to get this ability, but they also didn't want to take the penalty, um, or this ability, sorry, they also didn't want to take this penalty, they could do the op only, and then the next player wouldn't have the option of doing the event, even though the government didn't take it. So the first, what, whatever the first person in a given card chooses to do, dictates what um, options the other, the second player would, will get to do. Now the second player can also pass as well, which gets them a little bit of money. And that's the flow of play. A card turns up, uh, whoever's eligible does it, two, two players will do it, the next card comes up, they turn up, and so on, and that keeps going. Um, players are doing ops and attacking each other and making deals and doing all sorts of things. and. Um, they are maybe doing committing terror. They're rallying troops. They're building bases until propaganda comes up, and you know then these people, uh, whoever gets to act on this card right before propaganda, gets a sort of advantage, I think, because propaganda is when all the bookkeeping, scoring, and all the good stuff does it happens. And it, oftentimes I've seen the player who um, gets to act last, who gets to act on this card, will be the player that wins. Um, not necessarily, you gotta set yourself up, but if all other things are equal, that might be the case. So propaganda, you decide, first you decide who wins, and then you can, that's when the government and the FARC player get to adjust political control uh, based on how many pieces they have on different places, on, on different uh, spaces here. Uh, players get extra money based on their bases. A bunch of other special things happen, like uh, presidential elections and all that good stuff. And there's uh, four of these cards hidden in the deck here, um, basically in different fourths of the deck. It's randomly in one place, kind of like the game um, uh, Gumball Rally. Um, and then when the last card comes up, if no one's won, then you determine victory based on uh, uh, a calculation. So if you don't mind me getting personal for a moment, this game has a couple of my favorite things. It has its multiplayer, which I really enjoy. It has asymmetric sides, which I also really enjoy. And it involves negotiation, which I really enjoy. Um, you don't have to play the game... W w you don't have to negotiate in order um, to play this game. It can be played where you don't make any sort of deals at all. Uh, because of how the cards come up and you, the limits on your actions, it just might it might not be worth your while to stop the cartel if you're the FARC player. Uh, but I, I think it, it's a lot richer in a lot of ways if you do have that negotiation. The tension of those negotiations is really where a good portion of the emotional core of the game is. Uh, the abstraction of the conflict, the distance, despite the pictures on these cards and everything, and maybe because of the four-sided nature, it doesn't feel like there's a, there's a huge good guy or a huge bad guy that you can really get behind. It's really about um, this inter 
uh, personal uh, dynamic this uh, with the checks and the balances and making arrangements and and really uh, this 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 four-sided seesaw um, trying to balance on the precipice and make sure that your side ends up above the water. Andy and Abyss.